so welcome back to the channel for another superbike review. Uh, it's very wet, very cold today in northwest England, but that's absolutely fine because today we're going to be taking a look at a bike I've been wanting to review for quite a bit of time on this channel. This is a 2010 Triumph Daytona 675. The names Triumph and Daytona have long been associated together ever since a, a gentleman by the name of Buddy Elmore won the 1966 Florida Daytona 200 on a Triumph from starting in 42nd place and finishing the race in first place. Since then, Triumph has embraced the Daytona name with the first bike uh, being released a year after Buddy's win, so that was the Triumph Tiger Daytona. Triumph continued to develop and build this bike all the way through till 1973 when the bike was discontinued. Fast forward a few years to the early 90s and the Daytona name again was reborn in the form of an inline 4 uh, sports bike aimed at competing with the Japanese and Italian super sport machines of the time. At that time, the industry was led by bikes such as Ducati's 916, Honda's Fireblade, uh, the Kawasaki ZX9R. Triumph played with various engine configurations for the Daytona. There was a 750, uh, 900, 1000 and 1100, but they struggled to get the bike where it needed to be. In the last video that I did for this channel, so that was the 2004 R1, um, I mentioned in that video that a gentleman by the name of Nick Saunders has quite famously circumnavigated the world on a motorcycle and set a world record. Well, the record that he beat, he actually set himself, that he set a few years prior, and that was on a Triumph Daytona 900. Although it struggled to keep the pace of its competitors on the track, it was still a really great bike, and uh, even today it's still held in very high regard. In around 2000, Triumph started to move in the right direction. They brought us the uh, TT600. This was later replaced by the Daytona 600 and then the Daytona 650 a short while after. During this time, Triumph were experimenting with moving from a traditional inline four to a triple powered uh, Daytona. After a few years of experimenting, Triumph moved the triple powered Daytona into concept in 2002. They would continue to develop the triple power bike all the way up until 2006 when they finally released this, the Daytona 675. For the first time ever, the Daytona was a proper competitor for the uh, Japanese super sport machines. The chassis is a heavily modified version of that original Daytona 600, uh, with key changes being made to the wheelbase, to the tank and to the head angle. This new race orientated chassis, paired with the punchy 124 brake horsepower inline triple, made the Daytona 675 an instant hit on the track and on the road. The Daytona remained mostly untouched until 2009 when over 50 uh, small tweaks and improvements were made to the bike. This new upgraded version of the bike was treated to a new front end. Uh, the whole bike is lighter, we have three extra brake horsepower and the red line limiter was increased. So nothing huge um, but these small changes really made a big difference especially if you had the bike on the track. So this bike is a 2010 Daytona, um, so it's exactly the same as the old 9 version other than it was treated to a redesigned instrument cluster. For suspension, as you'd expect on a bike like this, everything is customizable, so you have adjustability in uh, compression, in rebound, in damping, both at the front and at the rear. Uh, for slowing you down, we have 308mm discs up front, and uh, they're with radial mounted calipers, radial mounted master cylinder here as well. So just before we get this bike out on the road and see what it's all about, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to our good friends at JD Comps who have sponsored this video by way of loaning us this bike today. They've been really great to us over the years, they've given us a lot of bikes to make content with and the very best part is they give you the chance to win the very bike that's been featured in the video. If you do want to get involved, I'll leave the link you need to their website in the description section of this video. So, first impressions on the Daytona. The first thing you really notice is just how aggressive the, the stance is. The seat's really, really high, especially for a super sport style bike. The seat's really high, the foot pegs are high, the bars are forward and low. There's no doubt it's a very, uh, a very race focused position that it forces you into. Just as the bike was warming up and I was getting my gear on it's got a lovely note to the engine it's got like a a very sweet mechanical purr 
Really, really nice. Mercifully, the sun has come out a little bit. Well, the roads are still very, very wet. That mid-range torque is really, really nice. It's really quite refreshing actually, you find on a lot of, um, not just the, not just the 600s but 1000 cc inline fours as well, all of the power is really really high in the rev range, which isn't really a problem if you're on the track, the problem comes when you're on the road, if you're going around everywhere bouncing off the rev limiter because all the power's in the high end RPM you're going to attract a lot of attention to yourself. Whereas with this, you've got loads of power all in the mid-range and everything you notice is how slim the bike is obviously being a triple does aid that with the engine being more compact but it's it's just so so slim it's unfortunate today that the roads are in the state that they are because I won't be able to test the handling as much as I'd like but even just now it's so easy to flick around obviously as this bike is a competition prize for somebody I'm sure they won't be very happy if I throw it down the road what I do love is once you get to about 5000 rpm the blue shift lights come on I really like that also the bike's just getting ready as if okay we're in business here and just like that within 15 minutes of the sun shining in true English fashion, it's raining again. That's such a, an unusual sound this bike, obviously being a triple it does sound a lot different but it's got a lovely noise to the bike when you're riding it and I'm not talking just about from the exhaust as well. Um, under your chin, just underneath the helmet, you can just hear the engine just ticking and purring away. I know on some of the the newer Daytonas, especially the Mortal 2 bike that they did. I've read reports that they moved a lot away from that mechanical kind of noise that you can hear. And you hear a lot more induction noise instead. Which I guess isn't isn't that bad of a thing in, in one sense, but there's something quite nice about the raw simplicity of just hearing the engine. Obviously Spike is running a stock exhaust as well, so it's a little bit quieter. But still sounds lovely. Especially once you get the RPMs up a little bit further back there on the bigger road, it just howls once you get into those high high rev ranges. So as this bike is 2010, there's not a lot in the way of uh, rider aids, as again 10, 12 years ago, that just wasn't really a thing on your average bike. Um, Strangely, the Daytona doesn't even have a slipper clutch when a lot of its competitors did have a slipper clutch at the time. I'm not sure what the reasoning for that was. Possibly, maybe due to the attributes of the triple engine that Triumph decided that they didn't need one, I'm not sure. Uh, but what we do have is a really nice LCD display. So as I mentioned a little bit earlier when we were off the bike, this display was uh, redesigned in 2010, so this version of the bike. Got a lovely LCD display to the left. We have a fuel gauge on there which is a nice touch and we have a gear indicator which is again a really really nice touch i think that i think a lot of road bikes should have you know if you're having some fun and you're on a, a twisty a road not as essential but if you're on a motorway or a, a long drive somewhere we've all done it you've been in six gear and you put the clutch in and got to go up another gear and there isn't one so having that indicator just save that embarrassment i do think as i say that is something that all road bikes should have I'm hoping there's not too much uh, rain and dirt that's flicked up over the camera lens and you can actually still see anything. Uh, the roads are so dirty today, I'm constantly wiping my visor. So it's such a shame the weather isn't better really, but as this is a competition bike obviously, we have quite a small window where the bikes are available to review. And as as I mentioned before, I really, really wanted to review this bike for a long time. In fact, when I first had the idea of reviewing bikes for this channel, 
this is one of those bikes that just came to mind what is nice if you have a 675 or you're thinking of getting a 675 there's no shortage of aftermarket parts um, even officially licensed parts from, from Triumph they have partnerships with Arrow Exhausts uh, they have their own quick shifter available loads and loads of stuff you can get to set up the bike to your preference Midrange pickups are so fast that's it's really really refreshing from what you would be used to right riding a sports bike especially an inline four so the bike tackles these uh, sweeping bend just effortlessly obviously it's not a fair representation of the bike's ability to be stuck behind a truck but the roads are very very slippy really really wet and it does feel a little bit twitchy going into some of the corners but it's well planted it, it gives you the confidence you plenty of feedback you know what it's going to do it's definitely not unpredictable by any accounts so i think if the roads were dry it would be a whole whole different story the problem is with having that all that power available in the mid range you kind of get to 8, 9, 10,000 RPM because it's pulling so well it's, it's like it's egging you on to go faster all the time one thing you do notice um, when you're passing through like the more built up areas it's not massively comfortable I think there'll be a, a very specific rider that the Daytona fits beautifully and for everyone else if you're a bit shorter I said the seat position is really high you know you might struggle getting your feet firmly on the ground and similarly if you're a bit taller it's quite cramped as you can see here my legs are really really high up on the tank I say because you really arch forward it's yes yeah, it's not the most comfortable bike I've ever ridden I can imagine if you're doing any long distance riding after a certain amount of time you probably wouldn't be much enjoying it mid-range torque is just such a strange experience see you know you're riding a super sport bike and the, the fact that the bike's so slim as I mentioned earlier but the pickup just <laughs> doesn't seem to match the bike somehow <laughs> I think because the bike feels so slim you kind of I don't know you get this weird sensation that it's not going to be very fast <laughs> and then it is it's just quite an unusual experience as it's so narrow here if you stick your legs into the tank I honestly feel like you could push your legs in tight enough and your knees would be touching each other I mentioned just before about the comfort I mean I've been riding this bike for probably about an hour and uh, constant cramp I've been getting in the left leg which is not directly the bike's fault really I mean as in the seating position everything it is clearly geared towards being on the track that's the whole intention that's the whole purpose and obviously on the track you're going to be moving your body weight around a lot more on the road though it's a slightly different story but you can forgive it for having such a fantastic engine this configuration just makes so much more sense on the road uh, so I think what we'll do now is we'll find somewhere a bit quieter to pull over um, and I'll give you my verdict and a conclusion after spending an hour or so riding around on this bike so I mentioned at the start of this review that this was a bike that I've been wanting to personally review for a very long time and I can safely say I wasn't disappointed. The mid-range torque is fantastic. It's an absolute breath of fresh air if you've rode inline four um, super sport machines where all the power is really high in the rev range so it makes it quite difficult to use on the road. Uh, whereas with this, all the power is right in the mid-range exactly where you need it. So it's a really, really fun bike to have on the road. 
it sticks to the road like it's on rails the bike stays really really well planted obviously it's been very wet today and um, the bike did feel a little bit twitchy at times but uh, it's not unpredictable by any stretch of the imagination it gives you loads of feedback and plenty of confidence that you can push as hard as you feel comfortable to so I guess the big question you could take away from this really is would I pick the Triumph Daytona um, over a traditional inline 4 super sport bike and I guess that really depends on the context if I was looking for a track only bike um, I think I would personally be inclined to stick with the traditional inline 4 with something like a ZX6R or a CBR600 but that's not to say that the Daytona wouldn't be any good on the track it would be phenomenal I think it's just personal preference more than anything else however if I was looking for a bike that I just purely wanted to have on the road I would pick the Daytona every day of the week it's amazingly agile it has all the power exactly where you need it especially if you're on the road um, it still looks beautiful even today and of course it is backed up by the awesome British heritage of Triumph so that concludes my review of this awesome Triumph Daytona 675 um, if you enjoyed this review half as much as I enjoyed making it please do consider subscribing to the channel uh, we do lots more videos reviewing bikes just like this one huge thank you again to JD Comps for their continued support please don't forget to get your tickets thanks again take care and I look forward to seeing you all in the next video